Okay, people do seem to be start trickling in from the other talk, so I don't want to keep you guys waiting too long. So I su suppose we can uh, get started. Um, so uh, just as a practical matter, uh, I can, uh, you know, during the talk, it'll be hard to uh, follow up on all the questions, but if you have questions during the talk, you know, just uh, post a message and I'll, I'll review I will review towards the end. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. We can see it. All right. So, hi everyone, and uh, welcome to my session on architecting robust JavaScript applications. Um, I'm very honored to uh, present you guys virtually. Uh, I've been. I think I've. Spoken at every JSConf, Belgian JSConf, since the the first edition. So uh, it's great that even this year, you know, even though it's virtual, we can still have it. Um, so before I get started and dive into my talk, just a very quick word about uh, myself. So I'm Tom van Katzen. I'm a, a computer scientist with a sort of broad experience in research, both in academia and industry. I used to be a professor at the University of Brussels doing research on programming languages, later moved to industry. I now work for Nokia and uh, Bell Labs, which is Nokia's research division. Um, but more relevant to this talk, I've been a past member of TC39, which is the JavaScript uh, Standards Committee. And I've also actively contributed to, to the JavaScript standard, in particular ECMAScript uh, 2015. Uh, and besides that, I'm just a very passionate user and advocate of JavaScript. And if you want to reach out to me, you can find me uh, using the handles at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so um, so my talk on uh, you know, architecting robust JavaScript applications, it's a, it's a security talk, but a very atypical security talk because when you uh, think about JavaScript and security, maybe the first thing that you might think of is like uh, XSS attacks or SQL injection or same origin policy cores, uh, you know, all these kinds of things. And you will not hear me talk about any of that today. Instead, you will hear me talk about uh, things like modules, uh, objects, functions, uh, whether or not uh, properties are mutable, the data flow in your program. And so uh, just normal stuff that we as software developers think about every day when we write our code. Now, so why, why, why this perspective? Well, um, so the software architecture view of security is actually something that I got from uh, um, a person called Mark Miller who once quipped that security really is just the extreme of modularity. Modularity just being you know, uh, what we all know from proper software development. So Mark Miller, just for context, he is also a member of ECMA TC39, did a lot of work on ECMAScript 5th uh, edition uh, and um, used to work also at Google on a secure subset of JavaScript called Kaha and is now the chief scientist at Agoric, which is a, a blockchain uh, startup company. And so this slogan, security is just the extreme of modularity, what is that all about? Well, if you think about it, modularity in a software engineering view means that you build your, your program such that you avoid needless dependencies among modules in order to prevent bugs. Because if one module doesn't depend on another module, then a bug in one module also cannot affect the other module. Now, security really is all about avoiding needless vulnerabilities in order to prevent exploits. And vulnerability, if you think about it, is really just another form of dependency. If my module doesn't depend on yours, then any sort of security vulnerability or exploit in your module will not affect me, right? So, so that's the basic sort of outlook um, for the talk. Now, my talk will be in two parts, roughly equal sized. The first part will be more about why it is becoming more and more important to write robust apps in JavaScript. And the second part will be more about sort of patterns, design patterns that help you write more robust JavaScript apps. So let's get started with uh, yeah, the first part uh, and setting the stage a bit for why we need to build more robust JavaScript apps. Now, first very important point uh, because 
uh, my take is often when I talk at the JavaScript developer conference, obviously many people uh, are coming from a web development background. So they're primarily doing JavaScript because of web development. But uh, today JavaScript really is uh, widely used across all the possible tiers that you can imagine from small embedded devices to of course mobile devices to the desktop in the browser, but of course also uh, outside the browser, if you think of platforms like WinJS, React Native, and so on. Server side, of course, we all know Node, uh, but you also know about serverless platforms like uh, AWS Lambda, uh, which is running JavaScript. And then you even have databases today that allow you to you know, uh, inject JavaScript uh, as part of a query. So really uh, with that, it's also of course becoming more important even more important to think about security because we're not just talking about stealing users' uh, cookies or uh, browsing history, which is already bad enough. But you know, uh, when you're dealing with embedded devices, you're dealing with interaction with the physical world, when you're dealing with databases or server-side apps, you're about talking about you know, the integrity of your users' data. So this is really quite important. Now, uh, what is common across all of these different platforms is of course the JavaScript language proper. And you may have heard of the term ECMAScript, which is just uh, another name for the standard version of JavaScript that, is, that runs the same across all of these many different platforms. And so I wanted to just spend a, a little bit of time talking about uh, how JavaScript got standardized and, and why that is important or that is still affecting us today. And um, so it actually has to do with a law in, in software development that's called uh, Conway's law. So Melvin Conway back already in the 60s observed the following. He said, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. And this is exactly what happened in the case of JavaScript standardization as well, because fairly early on, there were two standards bodies involved in the standardization of JavaScript. One was uh, ECMA, ECMA International, and they standardized the JavaScript language, uh, include, so the core language, like uh, you know, uh, the, the syntax, but also a small standard library, like uh, you know, the math object, the array object, JSON, and so on. And if, if we would talk about this in sort of operating system speak, we would call this the user mode of the system. It's everywhere that you know, applications run and can work with. And then there's this other standards body, W3C, which largely standardized the browser API. So the host environment, the original host environment where JavaScript ran, which was of course the browser. And um, they standardized a very large set of uh, system APIs. And we, we all know these, it's like the document object model to interact with uh, the HTML UI, but also other APIs like local storage, XML, HTTP request, and so on. Again, in operating system speak, we would call it call this the system mode. So this is everything that as an application author, you can't implement in the system itself. Someone has to give it to you so that you can use it. And it's because of this sort of split between the different organizations that the JavaScript standard is very explicit about what is part of the language and what is part of the host environment, in this case, the browser. And um, so this is, interesting because it makes it it ensures that javascript has sort of a very well defined boundary of what is part of the language what is part of the host and it's somehow somewhat that property that also uh, ensures the fact that we now see javascript in so many different other kind of embedding environments so the browser was the original environment but now we see it on the server in embedded devices and so on so uh, a second important point I wanted to make, and I think this is one that uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with, is uh, that JavaScript applications today are built from thousands of uh, different modules. So in June of last year, uh, NPM, the Node Package Manager, uh, crossed the threshold of 1 million uh, modules being published on uh, NPM. And if you look at the graph here, uh, so uh, NPM is the, is the red, uh, uh, bar over here, you can see that it sort of dominates, you know, all the other package managers from many different languages. So this is really quite astounding. And what is really even more astounding is this quote from the NPM blog stating that uh, the average modern web app contains today over a thousand modules and 97% of the code in a modern web app comes from NPM. 
And an individual developer is responsible only for the final 3% that makes their app unique and useful. So that's really quite something to think about. And actually, uh, what that means is that today we really have to trust a lot of code that we haven't written ourselves, but we do include that code into our uh, own web page or into our web server application, right? So if you're in the browser, uh, let's say in Firefox, for instance, you create a web page, that web page is going to be built from many different modules, but they will all have access to things like the cookies, browser history, and so on. On the server side, uh, it's even worse because you have your web server application composed of thousands of NPM modules, but many of them will be able to see incoming HTTP requests, your logs, uh, files that are available on uh, you know, your web server. So this is really quite something to, to think about because it's all great if everything works well, but what if things go wrong? And things actually do go wrong in practice, uh, for instance, so, uh, either in, on the on the browser side, uh, client side, or server side, we have actually seen many examples in the real world where there are evil scripts or evil packages that are being injected into applications. For instance, here's a tweet from the New York Times, which is, of course, uh, quite a big website that warned readers of a malicious ad that sneaked into their uh, website. Or uh, just a few years ago, just two years ago, you may have heard of this incident on NPM of this event stream uh, module, a very small module that got hijacked by uh, an external contributor who injected malicious code in an obfuscated way that uh, when the package would get installed, would actually sniff your local machine for uh, private keys of uh, Bitcoin wallets and would actually you know, uh, try to identify the private key and then send it back to the server of the attacker. So this kind of stuff is uh, really happening. And um, I guess the good news is that there's an increasing awareness that there are these kinds of problems. So over the last few years, we got uh, tools like NPM security advisories, we got GitHub security alerts that warn you when a package in your repository might be vulnerable. We got vulnerability databases that cover JavaScript vulnerabilities. So that's all great. These tools are fantastic, but these tools address the symptoms. They do not address the root cause of why those vulnerabilities appear in the first place. And so that is what I want to talk a little bit more in, in, in my talk is how can we actually avoid, the, the, get, get to the root cause and, and design software differently. So, um, so the way in which we, we want to approach the problem is to try and avoid interference between modules from the get-go. And in the security literature, they have a name for, for that. It's called the principle of least authority or POLA. So what does that mean? POLA is very simple. It just means that whenever you create a module, that module only gets access to the, let's say, powerful or dangerous APIs that it needs to get its job done and nothing more, but also nothing less, okay? So you give the module what it needs, like if it needs to make HTTP requests, yeah, you give it access to XHR. If it needs to write to disk, you need to get, give it access to the file system. But if it doesn't need that stuff, you just don't give access to that kind of stuff in the first place. So even if the module turns bad, it will not be able to access certain APIs and so will not be able to do that much damage, okay? Now, in order to practice POLA in JavaScript, we of course need the ability to sandbox modules, okay? To put modules into their own sandbox. And the problem today is in JavaScript that there isn't really a good user mode way of doing that. There's many system mode ways of doing that, and I'll talk about a few here. For instance, some of you may know web workers, which is a way of you know, loading scripts into their completely own separate JavaScript environment. Uh, but it's very cumbersome because you then need to use message passing to interact with, uh, with that script, as opposed to just using plain uh, method calls and property accesses. You can also use iframes in a web page uh, where you, you know, give access to, uh, you load code in its own iframe so it will get access to its own, let's say, global object. Uh, and then on, on Node.js, there's the, the VM module that you can use to achieve something similar. Uh, there's also extensions to that VM module like VM2 on NPM is a module worth checking out if you want to sandbox uh, JavaScript code. So 
But the problem is, yeah, there's all of these solutions depending on what platform, like if you're a front-ender or a back-ender, you have to use different stuff. And so the, the JavaScript standards committee in the last few years has been working on ways to introduce, let's say, isolation mechanisms as part of the JavaScript standard, uh, just uh, where, so that you can use it the same way everywhere. And um, the key, let's say, uh, language features that uh, that will introduce this are called realms and compartments. So what is a realm? It's essentially like an iframe, but without all of the DOM stuff that is associated with iframes or a more standardized version of Node's VM module is another way to think about it. And so I try to depict here graphically uh, what an application looks like that uses realms and compartments. So let's say we have a host environment that's like, um, uh, Node.js app or a, a, you know, a web page. And so you have your JavaScript application in yellow, and then you can carve that application up into separate realms. And every realm, each realm will have access to its own set of the primordial objects. So primordial, it's a weird name, but it's the name that standards people use to refer to built-in objects like uh, the array object, the function object, the math object, JSON, and also the prototypes like object of prototype, array of prototype, and so on. And so a realm has its own version of, the, of those uh, built-ins and it also has its own global object. Now, um, you can also create compartments and compartments exist in realms where the uh, built-in objects, the, the primordial objects are completely frozen. They're completely immutable. Right? And why is that? Well, different compartments can actually share access to the same uh, environment and we don't want objects in one compartment to start mucking about and changing the properties of, let's say, the array object or the math object, because that would, let's say, uh, that might screw up code that is coming from another module that's loaded in another compartment. Okay, so realms essentially give you uh, a place where to put code where it can, you know, destroy its own uh, built-in objects or uh, change the built-in objects without affecting the built-in objects of the code that, is, that loaded it. And then compartments are for more modern code where that doesn't uh, mutate the, the primordials because it's often uh, frowned upon to do that. Uh, but the benefit of that being that you can create many, many different compartments. Uh, it's a very lightweight isolation mechanism because all of these compartments are, are going to share the same set of, uh, of built-in objects, okay? And so uh, how does that look like in code? Uh, so this is, um, you know, just, the, so realms and compartments are on a standards track. So these details might still change, but it's at least, it at least gives you the uh, perspective. So um, a realm you created using the realm constructor, uh, it has its own global object to which you can assign new properties, and then you can call its eval function to evaluate code inside of that realm. Uh, inside of the realm, you don't have access to any uh, non-standard globals like the process object or the window object and any, any of these kind of things. And if you muck about with the, the, you know, the built-ins, uh, you know, they will only affect that realm's built-ins and not the built-ins of the uh, outer realm. So for compartments, it looks similar. Here you give an object uh, as, to, as an argument to the constructor. And these properties on this object that you pass will become global uh, global variables inside of the code. So you can then call this evaluate method on a compartment. And then this string will get evaluated inside that new compartment where it can see those uh, new globals. And again, by default, it only gets access to stuff like math, JSON, array, and not to uh, dangerous globals like the process object, uh, the window object, and so on. Okay, so um, just quickly, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, realms and compartments are at different stages in the standards process. So TC39 has this staging process starting from stage zero to stage four to indicate how mature a proposal is. So realms are a bit more mature than compartments. They're in stage two, which basically means they will at one point get into JavaScript, but the APIs might still change. Uh, compartments are still stage one, so that you know we'll, we won't be seeing that uh, uh, real soon now. The good news, though, is that for both realms and compartments, there are shim libraries available at these URLs here. So you can go to that to that uh, shim library, download it, and you already have you know a shim that implements the the standards API, so that you can start using that already today.
Okay, now on top of runs and compartments, there's another standard stack proposal for JavaScript that's called Secure ECMAScript. And Secure ECMAScript is really the subset of JavaScript that allows us to do this principle of least authority programming, this polar programming. And I guess the best way to look at it is to sort of start from uh, the, the, you know, the outer shell here. So uh, this is what I would call full ECMAScript. Uh, for those of you that have seen Gary Bernhardt's lightning talk at CodeMesh, uh, you will know about what. So this is the, uh, the what JavaScript that contains many horrible things that you would rather avoid in production code, which is why the JavaScript standards committee in, back in 2009 already uh, introduced you strict, which is uh, strict mode JavaScript, uh, which removes a lot of these uh, weird, this weird stuff. If you're using modern JavaScript modules, you're automatically programming in strict mode. So secure ECMAScript is like a further subset of that, where we essentially throw away the fact that uh, primordials are mutable. So you your JavaScript runs in a uh, in a environment where you can't mutate the array object or you can't replace the math object, you know, none of that funny business. And by default, the code also doesn't get access to any powerful global objects. So no window, no process. Uh, so it's safe to load code that you don't trust. Okay. So uh, secure ECMAScript is like an ECMA, is at stage one also, it's still, it's still very early in the standards process. But again, there is a, a, a a shim library, and if you use that shim library, you basically just have to import it into your code, like like so, import SES, and then it exports this lockdown function, which you can call to completely change or transform your current running JavaScript environment into a secure ECMAScript environment. So it was essentially lock down all of the uh, you know primor primordial objects and make them uh, immutable. Okay, so now. This is all fine and well, like you know, me talking about you have to put all of your modules into uh, its own sandbox. But of course, if you have to do that manually using the APIs I just showed, it's very cumbersome to do. Luckily, there's a company called MetaMask that created a nice open source project called Lava Mode, um, which is a build tool that automatically uh, puts each of your app's package dependencies into its own secure ECMAScript sandbox. And what is more, and what I really like about this is when you use the tool to do that, the tool will also generate this kind of manifest file that describes for each of your uh, package dependencies what globals that package accesses. Uh, and you can actually toggle that on and off. You can actually, so by default, uh, Lava Mode will, will not change the, the privileges of your dependencies. So they will still be able to access all of those globals. But at least now you get visibility into you know, my dependencies, what actually do they need? And if there's something fishy going on here, you can actually turn that off. Or if over time, different versions of the of a package start changing and they start adding new uh, privileges that they need, you will see that as diffs in your manifest file. And you know that might be a way in which we, in the future we can maybe prevent some of those uh, leaks like what happened with the event stream package and the Bitcoin wallets. So it also plugs nicely into Webpack and Browserify so that you can just you know, plug that into your existing uh, build environment. So this is a really handy and useful tool. Although I have to say it's still very bleeding edge because it's building on all of this uh, you know, uh, stuff that is sort of still in a standard track process. Okay, so um, I've reached the end of the first part of my talk. And just to do a quick recap, uh, what I talked about is that uh, today, modern JavaScript applications are composed from many different modules and you cannot trust all of that code, right? You're importing a lot of third party code into your application and you have to be aware of the security implications of that. And unfortunately, traditional security boundaries don't exist between different modules. So we have to add that ourselves. And secure ECMAScript is that sort of wrapper that you can put around the module to put it in its own little sandbox so uh, so that it cannot damage other modules or get access to your uh, important uh, um, resources. Now, of course, we as developers do not import those thousands of modules for them to just sit there side by side, isolated in their own sandbox. Of course not. These modules create objects that are exported or functions that are exported that are then used by other modules. So they have to interact, okay? So then the second part of my talk is going to be about design patterns uh, that exist to compose these modules or these objects coming from these different modules 
in safe ways, in ways that minimize interactions that you don't want. And of course, going forward, I'm also going to assume that all the code is running in a secure ECMAScript environment because without that sort of all bets are off, code can, can do all kinds of weird things that we don't want it to do. Okay, so let me just pause here. Right, so um, <clears throat> the second part of my talk, as I just mentioned, is about design patterns for building robust JavaScript apps. Now, when I say design patterns, maybe some of you may have at one point read or learned uh, from this book, the, the, the Blue Design Patterns book. Uh, it was published somewhere mid nineties. And that is the book that introduced uh, the typical design patterns that many of us are familiar with, like the visitor pattern, singleton, observer, uh, factory, and so on. So the book is full of patterns that show you sort of in an object-oriented way how you, uh, you know, put these objects together into interesting patterns. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is very similar to this. Of course, I'm not going to talk about observers and visitors. I'm going to talk about design patterns for uh, building uh, secure cooperation uh, across modules. So you will hear me talk about things like membranes, uh, sealer and sealer pairs and so on. But in essence, think of these really as things like the observer design pattern. It's just a pattern that you can use and take and implement in your own application in whatever way you see fit. So you typically don't import a library, you just write and apply that, that, that pattern in your own code base, how you see fit. So just like with Observer, there's many different ways that you can write an Observer, uh, and you know uh, they all achieve something that has a similar effect, but which choice is right sort of depends on your own preferences and your own application, okay? So with that said, let's dive in. And um, so the very first pattern that I want to talk about is how to make objects defensible or tamper-proof, how to make sure that when you create applications in JavaScript and you, uh, or objects in JavaScript and you hand them off to modules that you don't trust, that those modules can't destroy all of you know, the properties of your object. And um, let me just use a very simple example, uh, that of a counter object. So I have a, a counter class here. It has a constructor. It initializes with just a, a private field called count. And then it has an inker and a decker method to just increment or decrement that count. Okay, now, um, so as you probably know in JavaScript, if you use the class syntax, and it's no different if you use the, the traditional old style prototype syntax, this property isn't actually private, okay? So people might sometimes use an underscore to indicate that the property should be private, but nothing is preventing me from, uh, you know, just reading or even modifying that, that property. And, uh, if you're just working with your own code, that's not necessarily a problem. The problems start to appear if you have, let's say, two modules, uh, mo uh, Alice's module and Mallory's module. And uh, let's say Alice we trust, and uh, but Mallory might be a third-party code that we don't necessarily trust. And so the setup might be that we create this counter object and we pass it to both Alice and Mallory. And now what we want to protect against is uh, that Mallory can somehow uh, you know, modify that count or change the methods uh, in a way that uh, confuses Alice. So we really don't want uh, Mallory to be able to, for instance, replace one of these methods so that uh, uh, when Alice calls the counter object, she sh she's actually executing uh, code from Mallory. So that's that kind of attack we want to uh, protect against. And so um, for those of you that have been following a bit like the latest features in JavaScript, you might have heard of private fields. So that's uh, uh, one of these other TC39 proposals. It's already been implemented in, in some JavaScript engines where you can just prefix a, uh, a field declaration, a class with a hash, and that makes it private. Just like in uh, languages like Java, for instance, if you would create a private uh, field. Uh, so you have to also then access it using this hash notation. But uh, so the benefit of that being that you cannot access the, the private fields at least from the outside. Now. Of course, you're still uh, uh, vulnerable to uh, people swapping out the methods and, and so on. Um, and actually, yeah, you're also depending on this sort of latest proposal that's not yet uh, widely available. So um, another way that you can, can deal with this, and this is in fact 
if you, if you if you guys know Doc Crockford, the inventor of JSON and also the author of the JavaScript The Good Parts book that was widely influential uh, a couple of years ago, uh, he advocates uh, creating uh, your abstractions in a completely different way. He says, rather than using classes, why don't you just create functions that when you call them, return new objects, fresh objects, uh, like I do here. So I just have an object that returns an inker and a decker method. And because you know, in JavaScript, when you call a function, it creates a new private scope. You can put private state there. You just declare it as a variable. And the methods can read that, but from the outside, you cannot see that count variable, okay? It's just completely hidden inside of the scope of that uh, counter uh, function. And so uh, if you use that pattern, then uh, what you can do is simply also uh, call object.freeze, which is a method that's been, been part of the JavaScript standard for, for quite a while now, which will just iterate over all the properties of your object and make them immutable so that uh, it's impossible for uh, a client of the object. So if you already have a counter object, you can no longer do funny things like uh, you know, overriding the methods, uh, for instance. Now, unfortunately, there is still a, a, a caveat here because uh, as you probably know, in JavaScript, methods are actually just properties bound to function objects. And function objects actually have uh, a prototype. They can, you know, people can add other properties to function objects. Function objects are also mutable objects with their own properties. And so what you really would want to do is to uh, actually completely freeze not just the, the immediate properties of the object, but also all of the properties of all of its function objects. And of course, writing the code to do that by hand is a bit cumbersome. But unfortunately, fortunately, for instance, uh, uh, libraries like SES uh, introduce utility functions that actually do just that. So that actually, if you use SES, there is a function called harden that you can call on an object. And that harden function will freeze the object. And it will also freeze all of the function properties of uh, the object, making the, you know, essentially, once you have hardened an object, the only thing you can do with that object is call its methods or read public uh, public uh, properties. Uh, that's all you can do. Okay. So uh, if you hardened it, then uh, Mallory cannot go in, take your counter, take its increment method, and override its apply method or stuff like that. You can't do that anymore. Okay. So so that's sort of the first uh, important pattern. Uh, it's called tamper-proofing your objects, and it makes sure that. And you, you primarily have to do that with the objects that you're exposing, that you're exporting from a module that uh, clients that you don't trust uh, are going to uh, use, okay? Now, one problem with hardening objects, of course, is that once they're immutable, you can't just add new properties to it, uh, to them from the side. And uh, you know, many people have done that in the past. It's a technique that's called monkey patching. Uh, and it's sometimes very useful to be able to take an object and to just you know, slap in a new property because you need to remember some additional state of that object. So for instance, in my toy example here, uh, where I have my counter object, let's say we now, some module wants to associate a color with uh, that counter object. And so normally you would just do that by writing counter.color equals red. It creates a new property and you're happy. That's very much frowned upon these days because if there's different modules that all write to the same property, you can uh, quickly get into a kind of uh, uh, problems, okay? So what's a safer way to do that? Um, well, uh, in, in JavaScript, in ECMAScript 2015, so uh, already for a couple of years, there's this uh, little known uh, abstraction called a weak map. And uh, weak maps are really very useful to do exactly this kind of safe monkey patching. So how does that work? So um, over here, I create a counter object and I create this weak map object and it's just like you would create a normal map object. Um, and we're going to create the weak map object to store our color property, let's say. And then rather than uh, you know assigning color as a property to our counter object, you can just use the traditional map API to uh, create a binding between the counter object and whatever value you want to associate with it. And then if you want to read the property of the color of uh, the color property of the counter, rather than writing 
counter.color, you write color.get of the counter object. Now, the reason it's called a weak map as opposed to a normal map is because the, uh, the pointer that uh, is going from the key in the, in the, let's say, the weak map to the, uh, the actual counter object, that uh, pointer is a weak pointer. And what that means is if your counter object, if the CTR object here uh, is garbage collected because no one else needs it, then uh, this entry is also automatically removed from uh, from the weak map. So you don't get any memory leaks, exactly as if you would have you know, uh, added the property this way. So it's, it's really a great way to sort of add caches uh, in your application without introducing any uh, memory leaks. So um, one other interesting, quite interesting feature of a weak map uh, from a security perspective is that uh, they have this very peculiar feature that is in security speak is called rights amplification. And uh, it's, a, it's a strange term, but it's actually a very simple concept. The idea is the following. In order to get at the value stored in the weak map, like the, the, the string red here, I need to have access to both the weak map object as well as the counter object, the key object. So you need to have access to both the weak map and the key in order to get access to the value. And uh, so right simplification is exactly this kind of thing where you have two things and by putting the two things together, you can get access to a third thing. So for instance, uh, let's say you have a, a can containing some food, right? Just by having access to the can, uh, you can't get at the food. You need to have the can opener, which in this case is sort of like the key object, if you will. And if you have the can and the can opener, you can open the can and you can get access to the food. And this is a, a peculiar property that you can use to build all kinds of uh, uh, nice abstractions uh, of which I will describe one next, uh, which is the sealer-unsealer pair. And sealer-unsealer pairs actually allow you to do uh, encryption and decryption of objects without doing any crypto, without doing any cryptography inside of an application. And uh, it's actually built on exactly the same principles as public private key cryptography, but without doing any sort of mathematics uh, underneath. So let me first set the stage why, to show why or where that could be helpful. And then I'll explain to you how weak maps actually allow you to build that. So consider the following uh, setup. We have uh, our application and we have uh, three modules, Alice, Eve, and Bob. And uh, Alice and Bob need to communicate, but they can only communicate through an intermediary module called, like, that I call Eve here, Eve as in the eavesdropper in security speak. And uh, for instance, Eve might be uh, some message bus or some publish subscribe or a subscribe notify system uh, that Alice and Bob communicate through. And so the question is, how can Alice pass objects onto Bob? through Eve, but without Eve actually uh, um, being able to see what is inside those objects, being able to read properties of the object, or be able to tamper with the object by, for instance, uh, overriding properties and so on. And correspondingly, Bob wants to know when it gets objects from Alice that they're really coming from Alice and not that they're not tampered with by Eve. Right. So normally, in a distributed setting, this is exactly where you would use public-private key cryptography and Alice and Bob would need to use uh, public and private keys to encrypt and decrypt information that they would send over a network. But here, we're just inside of a single JavaScript app, and we want to have the same kind of benefit. So there is this pattern called the sealer-unsealer pair, and it works as follows. I can create a sealer-unsealer pair, and it gives me back two functions, a seal function and an unseal function. Think of seal as kind of like e encrypt and unseal as decrypt. And then Alice in her setup code needs to pass the unseal function to Bob, okay? And then later when she wants to communicate with Bob through Eve, she can seal the, uh, the value, uh, make it sort of encrypted by uh, calling the seal function, passing the value she wants to pass. And she gets back some uh, encrypted box object, which she can safely give to Eve. Bob in his setup code gets the unseal function from Alice and then registers some callback with Eve. For instance, whenever new messages appear, uh, she, he gets a callback from Eve and Eve passes him the box object. Now, in order for Bob to know whether this box object actually came from Alice, all he needs to do 
is to pass the box object to the unseal function and he will get back the original value uh, if that was in fact sealed with the corresponding seal function. And then he can use, safely use that. Now, how do you actually implement that? How, how does this uh, you know, make seal unseal pair function work in order uh, to, to play this kind of trick? Well, um, it's actually very simple. It's completely based on this write simplification trick that I explained earlier. So here's all the code that you need to use to uh, implement a sealer and sealer. Um, so my sealer and sealer pair, when you call it, it actually creates a new weak map, which you will call boxes, and it's private. It's only visible inside of this uh, function scope. We create a seal function. There is an unseal function. And then at the very end, uh, we just return an array of this seal and this unseal function to the caller. Now, what the seal function does is given a value, it will create a new box object. And as you can see, a box is really just an empty, frozen, immutable object. Uh, it's just a token object that is being used as a key inside of the weak map storing the value. And then it's being returned. The uh, unseal function takes one of these box objects checks if that box object is indeed a key in this box's weak map. If it is, it will just retrieve whatever value is associated with that box and return that to the caller, to Bob in this case. If it's not, then someone has passed in a box that was encrypted with someone else's uh, seal function, and uh, we, tr we detect that and we can throw some error, okay? And uh, so this is actually, this idea here, um, I actually got it from the people that worked on the Google Kaha project, but they actually got it from a paper from James Morris from the 1970s. So this is really old stuff. Uh, so this idea has been around for a very long time, uh, but it's only now that people are starting to see how powerful this thing can be. Okay, so, um, all right. So moving on uh, to the, the final set of patterns that I wanted to cover. Um, so this one here, might be a bit more familiar uh, uh, to many of you. It's the proxy pattern, but the proxy pattern applied in a way that you use it to uh, tame APIs or attenuate APIs. So what is this setup? Well, very often what you will have in an application is uh, your application, let's say Alice, um, has uh, access to sensitive resources like files on disk, incoming HTTP requests, uh, these kind of things. And so they are represented, of course, as JavaScript objects, uh, like, for instance, in a web application, you have the document object or the window object. And you want to give access to some of those resources uh, to a third party module, but you don't want to give full access to the resources. You only want to give access to maybe a subset of the resources. So what you do is rather than giving Bob uh, or Bob's objects access to the, the resource, you give them access to a tamed proxy object that will uh, only give access to uh, a certain subset of that sort of dangerous API. And so let me illustrate that by means of a very, very simple example. Let's say uh, we're building, let's say, our, a small file system abstraction. And uh, we have a file object, and file objects have a read method that returns, let's say, all the lines of lines uh, in the file as a string array. And you can write into a file object and you can ask how many lines there are. Okay, very simple. So then uh, one example of using this uh, sort of proxy pattern to attenuate APIs is to create a read-only uh, file abstraction. And so the way that would work is um, uh, when Alice wants to give read-only access to Bob, she actually creates this sort of read-only uh, uh, wrapper around the read-write file. And so here the make read only function gets access to the real file object and implements the file API. But uh, so the read and the num lines methods, they just get forwarded to the original file object. But the write method, we will stop and we will say, okay, sorry, this is a read only abstraction. Uh, so you can't do that. Okay. Um, and so just, so this kind of, um, the benefit of this kind of uh, pattern is that you can implement in your application logic whatever access control policy is relevant to your application. So we all know, yeah, in, in, in Unix, you have 
uh, you know, file permissions and you can have, uh, you know, uh, group uh, uh, permissions and, and owner permissions and you have read and write and so on. But this is much more powerful than that because it allows you to implement whatever logic that is relevant to your application and your data objects uh, using this pattern. You're not stuck with whatever some, uh, you know, operating system designer uh, or framework designer uh, thought of in terms of uh, authentication, okay? Now, there is one hazard with this kind of pattern, um, and that is the following. Uh, let's say that uh, we extend our file API so that there is now also a get parent uh, method that you can call, which gives you access from the file to the directory in which that file is located. And from the directory, let's say that you can also call a method called list files that just gives me back an array of all the file objects inside of that directory. If we are not careful, then uh, the following can happen. Uh, if we naively implement the make read only uh, uh, proxy object, so we still, let's say, forward the read method, we still stop the write method, so we say that's read only, uh, we forward the num lines method. But let's say we forward also the get parent method. So we just say if if you know getting the parent, uh, uh, getting access from the file to to its enclosing directory is not a very harmful thing. So let's just allow that. The problem is that Bob can now uh, take the read only file that it was given, call the get parent method, then call the list files method on that, and it has access to the original file object. So as you can see in the graphic here, we sort of rather than uh, you know, talking to the read-write file through the read-only file, it actually got direct access and it can actually start writing into the file. So in order to prevent that kind of thing, you can extend the proxy design pattern with something called a membrane. So membranes are a generalization of the proxy design pattern, which rather than wrapping a single object, will wrap an entire group of objects and they do that dynamically. So just as one example, uh, let's say you have uh, uh, your web page with the real window object and you load some third party code with an embedded uh, uh, script. And you, so we give access to a proxy object, not a real window, but like this half circle, which is like a proxy object. So what a membrane allows you to do if the developer or if the embedded script calls window.document, so they you know, access the document property, you don't give them access to the real document object. We actually give them access to yet another proxy object uh, that still enforces the same sort of security policy that, that we want our application to enforce. And so by sort of dynamically injecting all these proxy objects, uh, every time there's an exchange uh, or a method call, uh, you can actually make sure that your security policy stays in place no matter what kind of tricks the embedded script tries to play. So I don't have uh, time to go into full detail here, but I do have an article on my webpage that explains like sort of the gory details of this. So if you're interested in reading more, you can, you can do that uh, and, and have a look. All right, so uh, just taking a step back because I know this is a lot of information. I talked about compartments and realms earlier. Now I talk about membranes. Uh, how does that all fit together? Well, so the answer is that realms and compartments are sort of useful for managing their static boundaries that you put around, let's say a module, for instance. And with a compartment or a realm, you can actually manage what are the initial powers that this module gets? What are the initial global objects that it can get access to? But then once that module has been bootstrapped and it starts creating new objects and so on, then uh, the, uh, let's say, membranes allow you to uh, uh, track any new objects that are being created and still put a security boundary around that, okay? Uh, now, compartments and realms are something that is offered by, uh, that has to be offered by the standard or by the host environment. Whereas membranes, as I mentioned, is just a pattern that you can implement in, in your code. It's just JavaScript code. Uh, so it's all user land code. It doesn't need, uh, you don't need to be given a special API to implement that. All right, so just to, before I wrap up, um, I just want to mention, because I can imagine for many of you that these patterns are very abstract and you might actually wonder, is anyone actually using this kind of thing? And the answer is uh, yes, certainly. Uh, so these patterns are widely used uh, in industry and not by the smallest uh, companies either. So Google has used uh, patterns like taming uh, 
in their Kaha product to embed safe third-party content. Firefox is using membranes to isolate site origins from privileged JavaScript code. Salesforce has this uh, UI platform called Lightning, and they're using secure ECMAScript and membranes to isolate and uh, observe changes on their UI components. Modable is a uh, is a uh, company that created a secure ECMAScript uh, engine running on top inside of uh, embedded devices, so they can allow safe end-user scripting of IoT products. Uh, MetaMask, for instance, is a uh, a crypto wallet, uh, a web wallet that uses Secure ECMAScript to allow third party plugins in their uh, crypto uh, wallets. And then finally, Agoric um, is using Secure ECMAScript to uh, allow developers to write smart contracts that get executed on blockchain. So, of course, these are, let's say, very specific uh, use cases, but in all of these cases, security is paramount and people are using these, uh, these patterns. So, to wrap up, um, what was my talk all about? Well, remember I started with my slogan of secu viewing security as an extreme form of modularity, right? And so really uh, uh, what I wanted to get across is modern JavaScript apps are composed from many different modules that you cannot just uh, trust. Uh, so there's just too many of them, right? So you have to put them in a sandbox. and. Traditionally, it's been very hard to put uh, modules in a sandbox in a very standardized way. And so the, the standards committee is working on proposals like Secure ECMAScript to make that easier and more standardized. But just putting stuff in a sandbox isn't sufficient. You want, you know, these different modules still need to interact to create useful application. And for that, you need these sort of design patterns that allow you to, you know, put different modules together uh, in a safe way to minimize unwanted interactions. And I think understanding these patterns is becoming more and more important in a world in which we have more than a million modules on the, the NPM package repository. And with that, I want to uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them now, or you can also always reach me at my Twitter handle, uh, and I will also uh, uh, post the slides right after this talk so you can uh, browse through that and look at the links and so on. Okay. Let's see if there are any questions. Not seeing any right now. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.